Welcome back, everyone. Let's get started with our first panel. Hello. But my flight leaves at three, so I'll get to I think we're going to get started on the panel. And we'll, so we're going to have this first panel. Afterwards, we're going to be breaking for coffee. So look forward to that. Um, and we're ready to begin. All right. Can everybody hear me OK? Um, my name is uh, Tom Zeller, and I am currently a journalism fellow down the road at MIT. Uh, and prior to that, I spent most of my career writing about environmental issues, uh, including environmental justice. And Dr. Bullard has been a great uh, resource for that over the years. Uh, we're here to talk about what is environmental justice, um, which you just had sort of a master's class in from, uh, mm -hmm. from Dr. Bullard. But we're going to kind of try to drill down a little bit on what it looks like for folks who are working in this area on the ground uh, now. Um, and we have a distinguished panel with us to do that. Um, we have uh, right next to me here Richard uh, Marcantonio, who is the managing attorney with Public Advocates, which is a nonprofit law firm and advocacy organization in Northern California. I'm going to do just quick introductions of each one, and then they're going to uh, give you a more detailed introductions of themselves. Um, then we have Hilton Kelly, who is the founder and CEO of the Community In Power Development Association, uh, an environmental justice nonprofit working in Port Arthur. I think we may have seen some video uh, or on the slide. Uh, then we have uh, Sheila Holt Orsted, who you also met in Dr. Bullard's presentation, uh, an environmental justice advocate originally from Dixon, Tennessee, whose story, uh, if you don't know it, I, I think will be compelling for you. Uh, and then we finally have Kalila Barnett, who is the Executive Director of Alternatives for Community and Environment, which is a grassroots uh, organization that does community organizing and provides legal and technical assistance to the EJ community here in Mass. Um, so without further ado, uh, I guess we'll start with uh, Richard, and maybe you can just tell us more about you and what you do. Great. Uh, yeah. Well, it's, it's great to be here at, uh, from California, where we're celebrating the birthday of Cesar Chavez today. And this uh, feels like a, a really nice way to do that. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about the work we're doing with our community partners in the Bay Area. Um, my organization, Public Advocates, is a, uh, a civil rights and anti-poverty law and policy advocacy organization. Uh, we've been doing uh, this work for about 40, over 40 years. And um, in the, uh, you know, I, I guess this question of what is EJ, uh, there's certain themes that are, you know, that run through everything that we, we, we call EJ, and Dr. Bullard touched on those, I think. Um, I, I want to sort of lift up the ones that are very important to our work, recognizing that uh, we're working in a, uh, a metropolitan region uh, with seven million residents, an urban region, and uh, an affluent region. So some of, some of what I'm going to talk about is, is going to be specific to that. But the three points that I would say really define environmental justice in the work that, that public advocates is, is doing with our community organizing partners uh, first is the focus of environmental justice on the human environment, which uh, I think you know, Dr. Bullard gave us uh, uh, a lot of maps that really what they're talking about is the built environment uh, and how that, how, that, how that gets built and who it affects and how is really a central theme. That's number one. <clears throat> Uh, number two, of course, is the emphasis on community organizing and, and power building. Uh, so that's a second theme. And the third one, again, this is not definitional, but it, it brings a, a, there's a, there's a new layer that's been added onto um, a lot of this work in certain settings, and that is the, the theme of geographic scale at the metropolitan regional level, the, the question of regional equity that uh, Dr. Bullard has written about, uh, John Powell, uh, Angela Blackwell, Carl Anthony, Manuel Pastor, uh, many, many people have really uh, focused on that and, and urged us to focus on it because at the metropolitan scale, we both see the, um, the true starkness of segregation and the true map of, you know, inequality 
uh, in a way that we don't necessarily see it on a, on a city, um, at the city level. Uh, and also because a city doesn't have the power to address the, 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 the uh, full range of disparities that are really metropolitan regional in nature. So in the Bay Area, we've brought these themes together in uh, work that we, you know, we put it under the rubric of climate justice, uh, but it's just one way that you, you might think of, of a climate justice campaign. By way of background, this goes back to a 2008 law that California enacted, uh, SB 375, which sought, it's, it's an environmental bill. It's not an environmental justice bill, and we're working to change that. But we started with this environmental bill that uh, sought to reduce sprawl in order to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, right? It's a climate change bill. And the way the bill wants to do that is to coordinate our regional planning around housing and job growth, mostly housing focused, and our regional transportation planning, which is something that happens in every metropolitan region under federal law. We saw right from the beginning, we and our community partners saw both an, op you know, both an opportunity and a risk. The opportunity was that by, you know, if, if what the uh, environmental paradigm here is talking about is shrinking the, the metropolitan footprint of sprawl, then maybe this was an opportunity to reverse the dis disinvestment in low-income communities of color that's been going on since World War II and probably before then, uh, but particularly since World War II. And uh, so that was the opportunity, but at the same time, the risk that we saw was that when that investment came back in to East and West Oakland, you know, to Richmond, to Bayview Hunters Point, to East Palo Alto, uh, which is about a mile from where, you know, uh, uh, Zuckerman lives, um, Zuckerberg, <laughs> anyway, Facebook. Um, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a user, so it's a little hard for me to talk about it. If, if that investment comes back into these underserved and overburdened communities, then are we going to just end up displacing uh, those residents who have lived, you know, in tight-knit communities that ha but struggled to, to live in those communities for decades? Um, and, and, you know, the Brookings Institute has done some research on the, the suburbanization of poverty, and they found that the Bay Area is actually different from most places in that people who are getting displaced from San Francisco and Oakland are not ending up next door in Pleasanton. They're ending up, they're leapfrogging into the Central Valley where they have no transit, no jobs, et cetera. So, uh, we, we saw the risk and the opportunity. We didn't go into this thinking that we were gonna come out with a plan that was going to do a better job of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. We really focused on the needs of these communities. And so um, when our regional agencies in 2010 set out, they embarked on a three-year planning process to adopt a 30-year plan. Um, we held a retreat. We had about 30 organizations in the room. These were all organizations that, uh, they, you know, come to their work through the lens of benefiting you know, disadvantaged communities and meeting the needs of those communities in particular. Uh, but they focused on a range of issues. They focused some on affordable housing, some on public health disparities, some on public transportation disparities. Uh, some on displacement, some on jobs. Uh, and we asked everybody, you know, do you want to, do you think this, this is an opportunity to work together across our issue silos, across the whole nine county Bay Area region to see if we can move this plan uh, in the right direction? And I'm already out of time because I gave you too much of a warm up. Mm -hmm. I'll just cut to the um, bottom line, which is that through a community driven process, uh, the groups around the table actually came up with an alternative to the plan that the professional planners came up with for the region. It was a plan that emphasized more local transit service. It was a plan that emphasized more affordable housing both in East and West Oakland and in Pleasanton, you know, uh, in affluent suburban places. 
and it emphasized protections against displacement. And when the agencies analyzed our plan, which took us a year of advocacy to get them to do that, they analyzed our plan and they deemed it the environmentally superior alternative and they, they, their own data demonstrated that it better met their own goals that they set for the region, many of which were important goals around public health and, and uh, affordability of housing and transportation and all that important stuff. Our, our equity, environment, and jobs scenario was the, was the better alternative for the region. So I'm gonna stop there and maybe we can come back and discuss some of these themes. And so now we have Hilton and Kelly maybe bring this. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Hilton Kelly. I'm the founder and director of the Community Empower and Development Association located in Port Arthur, Texas on the Gulf Coast, on the Louisiana-Texas border. Um, my home is home to more than four major refineries, six major chemical plants, and one international incinerator facility, and a coke plant. Port Arthur, Texas is a very unique community. We have a very rich culture. We have a mixture of Louisiana Cajun and and, and Southeast Texas culture where we enjoy our shellfish, we enjoy our shrimp, we enjoy oysters, we enjoy crawfish, and we enjoy having a good time. <laughs> and it's a great place to raise children, but the one thing that we have in our community that's destroying it is a disproportionate amount of toxic chemicals that are being dumped daily, daily. We have the largest oil refinery in the Northern Hemisphere located in Port Arthur, Texas, a town of maybe 48, 46,000 people. One out of every five households have a child that have to use a nebulizer or take breathing treatments before they go to school or before they go to bed at night. Ironically, um, a classmate of mine, his little stepson, just passed away yesterday. He had been dealing with brain cancer for more than about eight months of his little life. He was nine years old. He passed away yesterday. His fight is over. And I know that this is not unique just to Port Arthur. I mean, we know that cancer is rampant in quite a few places across our country. But what's unique about Port Arthur is that we're being disproportionately bombarded with known carcinogens. People say, well, why don't you just move? Well, when do we stop moving and we stand and we turn and we fight for our right, a basic human right, to breathe clean air and drink clean water? This is why we can't move. How do you get up and just leave a way of life and a culture? That's like saying when it snow too much in Boston or New York and we have a blizzard, why don't those people just move? Why are they over there just freezing to death? <laughs> We're down here in flip-flops and t-shirts. Come on out to Texas. <laughs> So you understand how, how idiotic that is. You can't run because of, of natural disasters, but you have to stand and fight. This is a man-made disaster. Case in point, we, Veolia Incinerator Facility is petitioning to bring waste from Syria to incinerate in Port Arthur, Texas. We waged a battle against the United States Army in 2007 who fought to bring VX nerve gas waste from World War II to Port Arthur to burn. We lost that battle. And when we asked why didn't we get a public notice, they said, well, Colonel Barber, i never forget his name. It was a snafu in my staff, and they just forgot to put it in the paper to uh, give you guys public notice. How do you forget something like that? They shipped this material over five states. They circumvented federal laws to bring it to Port Arthur to incinerate and they're still bringing trucks in. Now they want to bring Syrian uh, chemical waste to Port Arthur to burn. We already have the largest oil refinery in the Northern Hemisphere, along with four other facilities. We already produce more than a quarter of the nation's chemicals and petroleum products. And now here comes chemical weapon waste from Syria. Where does it end? And what we're saying, enough is enough. Many times they tell us, well, you know, Hilton, we need the fuel. Uh, I mean, how do, you, how do you run your cars without the gasoline? These industries have to operate. 
What we're saying is that we don't have a problem with them operating, but every year they dump tons and tons of illegal emissions into the environment. We're talking, if you put barrels in this room, this stuff has volume, it has weight, but when you cook it and you process this dirty crude oil and it turns into a vapor, then a gas, all these various gases go out into the air that we breathe and many times we're left doing this. Wow, it smells like rotten eggs or you get a strange chemical odor. We're saying enough is enough in Port Arthur, Texas. The only reason why I got into this fight, we wanna talk about accidental environmentalist. You're looking at one. I was born and raised in Port Arthur, Texas, 1960, at the Carver Terry's housing project that Dr. Bullock showed in this slide. When I was growing up in Port Arthur, we grew up smelling the rotten eggs odor, the, the, the strange chemical odors, your eyes would burn. And I remember periodically I would get these intense headaches growing up in Port Arthur. And I have a cousin, his name is Tony Stewart, he suffered with respiratory problems all his life. And because of that, he was the smaller out of our whole family. He just had a very, very low weight all his life and he still suffered with it now. He's 54 years old. He never really got over it. But I was living in Oakland, California. I joined the United States Navy in 1979. I went away for active duty January of 80. And I spent six years in the United States Navy. I was stationed at Alameda Naval Air Station in the Bay Area. And when I got out of service, I decided to stay in the Bay Area and pursue a career in acting. When I was in high school, I loved theater. I loved stage work. I loved that whole production. And I finally got an opportunity to be an extra on a show called Midnight Caller, starring Gary Cole in 1988. And then with that opportunity, I became a stand-in for Michael T. Williamson, who played Bubba and Forrest Gump. And then I did a couple of stunts, fight scenes, and what have you. I worked with Eddie Murphy in Metro. But one of the things that sort of struck me was that it was time for me to go home for a while, take a break from the acting world. I went home to Port Arthur, Texas, just to visit, took a little sabbatical for about a month, and uh, I went to the Mardi Gras in February of 2000. And at that Mardi Gras, we had a great time. And I kept talking to relatives. They kept saying, well, you know, so-and-so died. This person died. Oh, she had a little baby, but he was born deformed, and he didn't last long. And I'm like, wow. And most of the deaths were cancer-related. And so I asked, I said, well, haven't you guys looked into this issue? Well, we don't know who to contact, Hilton. I said, well, what about the, the, the local government? Is the city doing anything about this disproportionate number of people dying and the air is still smelling worse than it did from 1960? And well, they, that's where they get their tax base from, Hilton. I mean, what do you want them to do, shut it down? No, that's not what I'm saying, but I am saying this. We have too many people passing away. The air is, is more toxic than it was from 1965. And so with that being said, nobody knew what to do. So I left, long story short, Went back to California, pursued, I mean, continued my career in acting, but I kept thinking about how somebody needed to do something. And I started writing down ideas. I mean, I have no background in environmental activism. I knew nothing of chemicals, but I kept writing down ideas and I wanted to share those notes with someone who was there that wanted to do something about it that gave a damn. And I didn't find anybody because everybody was stuck on trying to get a job at the very facilities that were poisoning them. And so by May of 2000, I moved back to Port Arthur, Texas, and I decided to do my best at making a difference. Before I go, I just wanna leave you guys with something. I wrote a poem because I was so upset one day. I was sitting in my, my living room when I moved back there and the sky was a bright orange and you could smell these chemicals. And I was so frustrated to where I picked up my pen and my pad and I started writing. It's called My Toxic Reality. I see your smoke rising in the air, two, three in the morning when you think no one is there. In the still of the night, my child starts to sneeze. In the still of the night, the other starts to wheeze. Oh, your bright, bright torch, it burns all night. To find my way through the house, I don't even need a light. The roar of your flame I've learned to ignore, even though it's combustion, vibrate my feet up on the floor. I know I live at the back end of town and I should just be quiet and not make a sound. You might even find this a little profound, but me and my neighbors are a light and dark shade of brown. I hope our leaders don't conspire to circumvent because these findings I have have a sulfur benzene scent. Excuse me while I cough. <coughs> my throat has a slight tickle. The air I breathe it smells and sometimes very fickle. 
If you went to take a bath and saw a rash upon your chest, would you shrug your shoulders and just wish yourself the best? Because this money they give is great and this is only flesh. But if you had the right insurance, you could go and take a test. Oh, I'm scared I'll lose my job if the pollution I can test. But if you died tonight, would your killers confess to the poison they put inside you that laid you down to rest? Would your family have to fight to pay your doctor bills as you lay six foot under up on a grassy hill? Now your job is gone and your company grievance has faded. Your spouse and kids tried to collect from them, but they said your death was not job related. My toxic reality. I would just like to just make a quick note. This is my first uh, book, and I wrote this book because I'm hopeful that the next generation will pick up and do something about the problem. We're doing everything we can to try to keep you guys from having to fight this battle. But this book is called A Lethal Dose of Smoke and Mirrors, Going Home for Better or for Worse. You can find it on Amazon.com, and also I brought 10 copies here. But um, there is a major, major battle going on for the very air that you breathe and the very water that you drink. And you cannot live without it. The earth is not making any more of it. Thank you. I think we're going to have a, a, a short video before. Uh, I, think, I think I wanted to talk about Do you want to talk before. first? OK, go ahead. Um, I'm Good afternoon, everybody. I really don't need that. I'm pretty loud. Um, um, just like Hilton uh, said, I, too, what had left my hometown of Dixon, Tennessee, and had moved away and went home at Christmas of 2002 and found that my community was riddled with cancer. And I was so concerned about it that um, when I went back to the Washington DC area in Virginia, and including my father, my father had cancer, <coughs> my aunt had cancer, my cousins, and we had a farm that had been in our family since uh, post-slavery. And uh, the county had bought the property next door and allowed, uh, they turned it into a, a, a landfill, or at first it was a dump, they took the families that had lived there since post-slavery's property, just showed up one day and started to dump their trash. That was the designated place for the people that lived in the town to, to dump uh, their trash. And so it eventually became a dump because those people moved out. And it was, as Dr. Bullard said in his presentation, it was 57 feet from, from my family's property. We owned a 150 acre farm. And uh, so I, I was so concerned and I went back to Virginia where I was, I'm a former Miss Tennessee bodybuilder. Um, I was teaching aerobics and at the time, I was um, playing in two adult women basketball leagues and doing personal training and teaching aer aerobics classes. And, but I told my husband, I said, you know, there's too many people in my hometown. He was in the military, and every time he would leave, I would go back home to Dixon. And I'd grown up there, and I didn't leave till I was like 31. And so I said, I'm just going to get a physical and, and, and see, you know, just, just to make myself feel better, because I have this gut feeling that something's wrong. I, I had no reason to believe that, but I just knew something was wrong. Uh, and not really necessarily with myself, but just something was wrong. And so I went to the, to the doctor, and the results were stage two breast cancer. So I too, like Hilton, decided that I was gonna move home and figure out what was going on and, and do whatever it took to change whatever that was. And I, I think I'll stop there because the, the video was done by the Washington Post and Pierre actually was nominated for an Emmy, a short documentary. And um, he went to New York to the big Emmy party and everything and um, he, he didn't win, but he was nominated. Then he won a local Emmy. Um, so uh, he did a pretty good job. So I'll finish after that if I have a little time 
afterwards, but uh, we can watch the video now because it kind of says it all. If my father had known that his well water had the 15th most toxic chemical known to man, that he would have gotten hooked up to municipal water. But the county of Dixon, and the city of Dixon, and the state of Tennessee, and EPA failed to warn him that his family was drinking tricorrhythmia. The reason I believe that this is environmental racism is because every single Caucasian family in this county that was found to have trichloroethylene, TCE, in their water, <coughs> according to the state record, they took them off the water, they informed them of what they had been drinking, and they provided them with a alternate water source with the whole family, they wrote us letters <coughs> telling us it was okay to drink it and that it wouldn't cause any adverse health effects. You may want to add your stuff. Yeah. Our property is 57 feet from where they dump toxic chemicals. Property values in this area are zero. Probably can't give this any anyway. Who would want to live next to um, a toxic dump? It's a big dumping ground. We have a 150 acre farm that is worthless. Christmas holidays and found that this community was riddled with cancer. My father was one of them and my aunt who lives next door had cancer. I was so concerned that I returned to Virginia and scheduled a physical and to my surprise I found that I had stage two breast cancer. I thought I was a pitcher of help. I was very athletic, I was a personal trainer. In 1991, I was Miss Tennessee heavyweight and mixed pairs champion. I had to fight that. And I had to find answers and tell my story and be there for the next person that might find themselves in this situation. After, um, well, for 10 years we fought them. They settled with the white families throughout the 10 years. Some of these families that they settled with lived uh, 10 miles away. But it took 10 years and um, through two bouts of breast cancer, uh, I survived and I'm still here, but 
I have to give Dr. Bullard most of that credit because he was the rock. Um, he educated me on the politics of pollution and he told me what we were dealing with and, and basically told me I had to figure out how to beat cancer because as some of my lawyers told me, I was, I, they were waiting for me to die because that's what lawyers do is that they, f they, they figure out who they're really dealing with. And in my family, the rest of my family just wasn't fighters. They're just not. Uh, I'm that kind of beast. If, if I know I'm right, then I will fight you with my last breath. And, uh, you know, Dr. Bullard was there for me. And, um, you know, and we did rallies. We, we helped. He had conferences. And uh, uh, we did everything we could could do to raise awareness and to fight these people, to be a nuisance. But at the end of the day, he knew that we had to have lawyers um, because they could ignore us to a certain extent, but they, he found the lawyers that they could not ignore. And um, that was NRDC. I see Al is here. Um, hi, Al. Uh, NRDC and uh, um, the uh, NAACP Legal Defense I mean, the, the oldest civil rights law firm in the country took the case, and um, they were not to be ignored. And after 10 years, uh, we fought, and we won. We, as you saw in Dr. Bullard's presentation, there was a settlement agreement. But um, so to answer the question of what is environmental justice, uh, I can say I. I am what you get, Dixon County is what you get when there's not environmental justice. And I'll end on that. Thank you. <laughs> and now we have uh, Kalila Burnett. Thank you. Um, it's a privilege to be up here with all of you and just hearing your stories. My heart is like pounding a bit just from the, the gravity of the situation that we're that we're facing. Um, you know, one thing that just occurred to me that I feel like is really important to say is that, you know, these are tragic stories that we're hearing. These are tragic instances that people are facing day in and day out. And so one of the things that we all need to remember is that because folks in this country, in this world are living this way, we're allowed to live the way that we are being here in this beautiful building, having access to all of these resources, that's the way that this system functions, right? That there are some people that have to live with trash dumps so that we can live in our Priuses, et cetera. And so if we wanna have an approach to changing it, we have to remember that our lives and our stories are connected, uh, that it's not just about individual cleanups, it's about changing the system that puts uh, communities against each other, that allows communities to be overburdened by one thing so that other people can be free and have access to resources. So as Tom mentioned, I'm the Executive Director of Alternatives for Community and Environment, um, also a Roxbury native, so just way down Mass Ave. Um, for anybody who takes the number one bus, you'll end up in Dudley Square, which is where our offices are, and um, we're removing our offices today. So um, you guys are giving me a respite from <laughs> picking up boxes and, uh, and carrying the dollies across the street. And um, just wanted to share a couple of, of, of brief things about the way that ACE does its work and um, the importance of environmental justice and kind of what it is. You know, so I really credit you know, my relationship with ACE um, for my own personal and political development and really understanding what EJ is. And so um, some people, some local folks maybe remember a while ago, like sort of in the late 90s, there was this telephone company called 9X. Do you guys remember 9X? And so they had this, um, this ad that was like, if it's out there, it's in here, right? And talking about their phone books. And so that's um, uh, one of the things that I learned through interacting with ACE and really kind of uncovering what is environmental justice, what is environment, is that the environment is not just out there in New Hampshire and in the woods and with the polar bears, it's here, it's in the city. It is about um, the health of our communities. It's about the health of our people. 
And we at ACE believe that everyone has a right to a healthy and safe environment, regardless of where they were born, what they look like, what language they speak, or how wealthy their family is. Um, and I'm sure, you know, Dr. Bullard uh, gave, you know, as I said, sort of gave a master class on what the statistics are even today uh, about the conditions that folks are facing, um, largely based on race in this country. So ACE started about 20 years ago as an organization for law and education. We were founded by two attorneys, two white attorneys who you know, got inspired by the early parts of the EJ movement. And our work has transformed over the course of these 20 years to really be about building the power of low-income communities and communities of color to achieve environmental justice. So this work that ACE is a part of is a movement. Right, And so we believe that in order to make change in society, it's not just about individuals or individual organizations, it's about collectivity, it's about the power to really uh, make change. The other piece about it is that we have a deep belief in the value of leadership and the lived experience of communities that are directly facing the impacts of the environmental crisis. So it is important that there are um, you know, executive orders, that there are, um, you know, state policies on EJ, uh, but it is also important that we recognize that the folks that live in communities need to be at the table when decisions are being made about what is going to happen in their environment. We use three core strategies to get our work done, and I'll talk about them really quickly. So one is community organizing. Um, you know, just a really fundamental belief that we need to get there with the folks directly affected being at the table. The other thing that's important about community organizing is that it allows us to really talk to people, meet them where they're at, meet them on the bus, meet them um, in schools, and really help them to understand and really see that the individual problems that they're facing are not just because they're a bad person, they don't have the right parents, they can't get the right job, but there is actually a system that's designed that is putting you where you're at. And so if we're gonna rethink um, how to change that, we need to do that together. We have uh, community organizing programs with young people and adults called the T-Riders Union, is our transit justice program, and the Roxbury Environmental Empowerment Project is our youth organizing program. Um, and maybe during the Q&A we can sort of talk a little bit more about the details of the work, but one thing um, that's really important to share that I think demonstrates the power of community organizing is that, uh, let's see, on Tuesday, uh, the MBTA, so that's the public transit system for folks who live around here, you know the T, um, announced that it was going to um, extend the use of the student pass to include weekends. So many um, Boston Public School students get issued a pass, I think Cambridge also as well, through the system. It's a, it's a discounted uh, pass, but it was really limited. And so young people were saying, you know, we wanna get to school, but we have work that we need to do to support our families. We have other activities that we need to engage in. We have healthcare appointments. And so we have been in a battle um, with uh, the MBTA, with other youth organizing groups to really transform young people's access to public transportation. So that was a really exciting and, and big victory for us. Um, the second area of work that we do is legal and technical assistance that supports community organizing. So as Sheila mentioned, um, you know, we need to have a strategy where folks on the ground are really deciding and, and figuring out, you know, how do we want to change the conditions that we're facing? And often you need someone who has uh, a legal hat in the room to help to make sure that those desires, or those demands, as we call them in organizing, get codified and really, uh, really happen. And so we uh, have a staff attorney, a wonderful staff attorney who's here with us today, Stacy Rubin, and we also coordinate a pro bono network of attorneys and other licensed site professionals across the state that provide assistance to, uh, to neighborhood associations and community organizing groups. I'm almost done. Um, and then the, the last area uh, that we feel like is an important strategy is around strategic coalition. So this is kind of back to that theme of movement building, that we cannot do our work alone that we need to be in partnership with people across the city, across the state, 
um, that we're not going to be able to realize this beautiful future unless we're connected uh, with um, with other people around. So, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> So uh, there's a couple things that kind of strike me in listening to, to you all tell your stories and, and to Dr. Bullitt as well. Um, and that's it. On the one hand, you know, we're now 20 years uh, removed from the 1994 executive order. Um, we have uh, 50 states with some sort of EJ uh, law on the books. We have 20 years of data kind of making plain uh, these connections between communities of color and and low-income communities and pollution. Um, and we even have this sort of forum here now where we can kind of talk about uh, environmental justice. But, but then again, on the other hand, listening to you all, it sounds very much to me like it's, it remains a very kind of poignant problem and that there's a lot of ignorance uh, out there. And by ignorance, I mean there's just a lack of familiarity with the very term uh, environmental justice among the general public. Uh, and maybe more importantly, public officials, elected officials. And I wonder if that, if you find that to be the case, and uh, and if so, you know, how does that impact your work, and how is that kind of slowing things down? I mean, maybe I can kick that to you, Richard, to kick things off. Well, you know, I, I, I mentioned that one of the big themes is the focus on the built environment, and um, something that I've started to understand. You know, I, I there's a lot of people out there who, um, you know, there's a lot of talk about we're in a colorblind society and all of that nonsense. And, 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 you know, some of it I understand, but a lot of it is coming from people who should know better. And I'm trying to think, how do I talk to those people? <laughs> what, I've, um, what I've started to realize in this work is that um, there's structures of belief. When we talk about structural racism, there's structures of belief, and those are important. But there's also like structures that are physical structures that are concrete, that are steel, that are brick and mortar, and they don't change that quickly. They're pretty much baked into the physical environment, and those are the structures that determine where you live if you're a person of color as opposed to a white person. They determine what zip code you live, you know? They determine how you get from point A to point B or whether you can get to point B where the jobs are. They determine whether your kid can go to a good school or not. I mean, these are, these are literally physical structures. So, um, uh, you know, the, and so the fact, the fact is that those, so, so th number one, that tells you that those things are not gonna change uh, quickly. But the other thing that I've come to understand is that why are they getting worse? Well, they're getting worse because, you know, one reason they're getting worse is because we've got big agencies. I think I mentioned uh, regional transportation agencies. They're, they're called Metropolitan Planning Organizations, or MPOs. If you don't know what those are, find out. This is important. They're in every, every metropolitan region, and they control hundreds of billions of dollars in transportation funding. Um, and the way that that money flows, I'm going to mix metaphors a little bit, but you know, if there's peaks of affluence and valleys of, you know, of, of, of burdened communities and underserved and underinvested communities, the money kind of flows uphill. So I got to, I got to work that out. But anyway, the money is flowing in these, phys <laughs> according to these physical grooves very often. I mean, in the Bay Area, one example is you know, the disparities between if you're a bus rider or if you're a commuter, and I'll just wrap up with this, that, um, you know, for the cost of one mile of new BART track, Bay Area Rapid Transit is, uh, it's not the T, it's not light rail, it's heavy rail, and it moves a lot of people from suburban, you know, disp disproportionately white and affluent suburban communities, mm -hmm. flies them over the people of color communities and gets them to the downtown jobs. Hundred million dollars a mile. We could operate. I don't have the number for you. We could operate a lot of bus service a year for that kind of money. So, it's interesting to me that you say it's getting worse. I mean, is that your, is that everyone's perception? Well, you know, with with Executive Order One Two Eight Nine Eight being signed, I think that it really was a great tool in the toolbox mm -hmm. to help combat uh, environmental racism and environmental injustice simply because it gave 
each government body an opportunity to play a role in helping to right that particular wrong. Now, we know under the Bush administration, it was very, very difficult to get assistance from the Environmental Protection Agency to do their job because they cut their funding. But under Barack Obama's administration and because of the uh, Executive Order 12898, we're seeing some things being done in the community. Coming from the grassroots perspective in West Port Arthur, as a matter of fact, the Carver Terrace housing project that was shown earlier, it's been closed down. It's been closed down for about three months now, and I'm, I'm very happy about that. That was a government housing project, and because of Executive Order 12898, which basically uh, uh, articulates how people should not be living in close proximity to large emitters, uh, pollution emitters, well, the, the Carver Terrace has been closed down. And um, HUD has to play a key role whenever they think about housing for low-income folks. They have to make sure that the material that is used is not toxic. They have to make sure it's in a safe uh, highland area instead of lowland areas. And also when it comes to transportation. So we're seeing some progression when it comes to cleaning up the environment, but some of the things that set us back a step or two was when we started talking about Keystone XL pipeline. Now here it is, Port Arthur is trying to make a progression, and when I speak of Port Arthur, I'm talking about Houston, Texas, the Deer Park area, where Juan Pardes lives, he's fighting the same battle I'm fighting. They're gonna be receiving an extension of that Keystone XL pipeline that's bringing this tar sand, this bitumen, which is high in sulfur, high in metals, high in other dangerous toxins that we're trying to push down and reduce, and the EPA is doing a great job at assisting with that. But now, here comes this tar sand. There's gonna be about a 20 to 25% increase in those toxins. I mean, we stamp out one fire, but here comes another one. So if we could just get a handle on which way we want to go with this thing and then spearhead with renewable ideas which will create jobs which will create opportunities and let's get it done sheila Khalila, do you want to chime in at all um i i noticed on dr bullish chart that a, a lot of the injustices that environmental justice and environmental racism are in the south and i can say with my case uh, the letters that they, they wrote letters to, to my family and to the white families and every single white family's letters said, you, uh, your water is bad, don't drink it, we're gonna get you off. And they actually paid to hook them up to the municipal supply and they told every single black family that the water was safe to drink and it wouldn't cause adverse, adverse health effects. And that was done, the letters were sent out throughout, starting in the 80s, um, but it was just, 2011 that you know they fought they took their, their their stand that what they did was okay you know this is the bible belt this is you know 2011 2012 that they still felt that either we were less than human or what they did was not right uh well, it was okay, and that they hadn't done anything wrong. So they fought to, to continue to drink the contaminated water. Uh, they, they fought a, you know, two mega law firms that was, had all these motions and, you know, that sued them and said, you can't treat people this way, but they wasn't giving it up. They, they wanted to think the way they wanted to. They wanted to treat black people the way they wanted to. So I, I think it's, it's getting better. I can't say that things have not changed, but we still have a long ways to go because um, we still have situations like that. And and since I've been 2003, when you know I kind of got a, a drafted into this movement, um, I, I can't say that there's too many communities that are in this fight that that it, it comes easy that they bring to attention of the people that are treating them bad and then they say okay we will treat you better they usually end up fighting to their death and some of the people never get justice sometimes i feel guilty because i was the one of the ones that won but most of the time it's not they don't have the and i don't i don't really even even though i got a settlement that that's it's really not a happy ending because I lost my father and I've had two bouts of breast cancer and the rest of my family has illnesses and my community is 
is riddled with cancer. So, you know, we have we have a ways to go. So, um, it's we're not there. Do you want to jump in? Yeah, just agreed. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and also, you know, I think one of the things that we actually as recently as a couple of days ago we're talking about at um, a breakfast celebrating our pro bono legal and technical assistance network is that. Uh, these toxic uh, facilities are still being permitted. They're still getting permitted. So I think, unfortunately, you know, when people are thinking about EJ, um, not every government official, but uh, many of them, you know, it's like, oh, let's make sure that you know we're putting something in the paper. Make sure that there's, you know, translation. It's it's about sort of process or it's rather participation, making sure people know about it. But I think the sort of hard line shift to be like. Let's take into account the already existing EJ conditions. This is an overburdened community. Does it actually make sense? Is it actually right to put that in that community? It may fit your permitting requirements, but is that what we should be doing? And so I think that's the next step that really does need to happen. So uh, another question I have is that there's an undercurrent to all of this is that, uh, and I think uh, Bob, you mentioned this, um, Environmentalism has long sort of been regarded as the province of the leisure class, I think is the way you put it. And um, I wonder, where does environmental justice fit in today into the larger environmental movement? Does it fit in? What is the traditional relationship then? And uh, you know, are there ways in which those two communities have come together to kind of move things forward? Or has the friction kind of held things back? Um, Kalila, you actually, we spoke a little bit about this before, so I know you have some thoughts. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I think just, you know, there, there have been some shifts and changes and some, you know, um, mainstream, or at least in the EJ movement, we sort of call them mainstream, you know, enviro or green groups, you know, have, um, have made some shifts. Some, um, I would say, you know, sort of sector wide, those not have not been just because of, you know, people's general benevolence. It's been folks have been called out for, you know, doing things and having practices that they shouldn't be having. Um, so I think that there are, you know, there are programs of groups that have, you know, talk about environmental justice, et cetera. But I think one of the big disparities that is really important to call out is around funding. So um, just before I was coming here, I was looking at this report that um, came from this, the Committee for Effective Philanthropy, and it's called Cultivating the Grassroots. And so just one quick statistic from that. Um, so in 2009, environmental organizations with budgets of more than $5 million received half of all contributions and grants made in the sector, despite comprising just 2% of environmental public charities. So, um, you know, we're kind of in the grassroots sector working with one hand tied behind our back. We just do not have the resources to be where our communities really need us to be, where we really want to be. And so in order for us to, you know, work together, to be, you know, on the same playing field, to to, to continue to foster relationships, to do, I think, what is probably ultimately, you know, achieve the goals that we all have, that funding disparity really does have to be addressed. And how do you direct that? I mean, how do you affect that in some ways? Like, why, you know, why should I direct my funding towards environmental justice concerns versus, you know, saving the whales? I mean, apparently that's not happening. Anyone? I would say, I can just, sorry. I, I would say because we're not winning. Yeah. We're not winning. The strategies around kind of funding, you know, national groups to just be down in Washington, and we're not winning. And we need different strategies. We need folks who um, are directly affected to be at the table. Many of the organizations like ACE, Uprose, and you know other EJ groups across the country are winning incredibly important local battles, are changing things, changing conditions. And those struggles and those stories need to be lifted up if we want to win. I think, that is, I think that is critically important that a lot of your larger NGO groups uh, seek out environmental communities, uh, environmental injustice community leaders where they can partner with them and get a more robust uh, look and feel at, at, at what's actually going on on the ground. I mean, I spent a lot of years and dollars coming back and forward to Washington, D.C. And finally, we got um, uh, Lisa Garcia. She came to Port Arthur, Texas. 
uh, um, uh, Lisa Jackson came to Port Arthur, Texas. As a matter of fact, the EPA played a, a, a really, really major role in helping us to get a clinic in the west side of Port Arthur. Um, I don't know, we had a consent decree that was posed against a refinery in our community. And those dollars, some of those dollars were used to build this clinic that was desperately needed. And uh, my hat is off to Lisa Jackson for uh, spearheading that and working with our group to get that done. And now we have a clinic that's serving a community that many of them didn't have transportation. There was a huge health disparity and they just didn't have any means of getting to where there was health care. So that health disparity was eliminated by putting a clinic in a community of more than 2,000 people. Now we're still working on getting a grocery store in that particular community, believe it or not. But Port Arthur was once a very thriving community and all of a sudden, you know, when the money was dried up because some of the industries, for whatever reason, stopped hiring local, there was white flight out of Port Arthur in 1975 and everything went downhill. I mean, the, the loaning mechanism was taken away. The last bank in our community almost shut down until it was shown where they could not shut down because they were the only bank in our community. So we have to learn how to partner together with the right folks and share some of the funding to help build up those grassroots communities so we can continue the fight. A lot of the fight, now, and I'll close, but a lot of the fight lies with not necessarily having these industries to, to, uh, to have more regulations posed against them, but just to get them to obey the Clean Air Act laws that are presently on the books and reduce the amount of illegal emissions that they're dumping and quit violating the law would be a, a huge step in the right direction. Because what we're seeing, these guys dump tons and tons of illegal emission, benzene, sulfuric acid, sulfur dioxide, 1,3-butadiene, which is a known carcinogen, heavy metals, you name it. And then they pay a $500,000 fine, a $40 billion a year company. Do the math. <laughs> it's cheaper to do it that way than it is to. Uh, Richard or Sheila, I don't know if either of you want to chime oh. in on that. Yeah. Or um, I think some of the responsibility um, lies with our government agencies because uh, in my situation, uh, it was the government agencies that we were fighting uh, against. So we're going to have to hold them responsible because the letters that, that the black families receive it was on the EPA's letterhead. They had already been cleaning up sites around the country when they wrote my family letters saying that TCE was okay and that it was safe and that the, it got over 160 times what people, humans were supposed to be exposed to. But when we got to, to um, uh, not really to court, but when we started, when we filed the lawsuit and we looked to EPA for help, Lisa Jackson, our, our regional director, you know, none of those people were there. We took the fight to them. We, there was churches ac across this country. There were um, uh, environmental groups that were sending letters. We had a, a, a Co-op America did an article on Dr. Bullard and, and my family, and they put a self-stamped um, uh, insert into the magazine just asking people to send those to Lisa Jackson and saying, please go down to Tennessee and help this family. Lisa Jackson sent those postcards back to the very EPA regional people who wrote the letters in the first place. So we're gonna have to hold EPA and these other agencies, because there were state agencies, there were regional uh, agencies that all knew what they were doing. They were well aware because if they didn't, they wouldn't have got the white families off the water and hooked them up to the municipal supply. So um, our government agencies is going to have to do better, you know. We and we can't. Um, yes, yes. Go ahead. Hi. Um, I, something is uh, whirling in my brain. Um, I'm connected to the innovation communities um, locally, globally, um, and I'm getting to know the clean tech space and um, I'm wondering on another angle of this is to get your voices and the communities that you're serving to partner with these incubators and accelerators who are um, 
investigating new technologies and new means for uh, clean tech and environmental innovation. I was at the Commission for Sustainable Development Conference for a number of years at the UN level, and there were side events for innovation around waste management and water sanitation and energy. And so it seems that it would be an interesting other angle to take um, to really uh, investigate the various incubators around the country, including Massachusetts, which there are a ton of those, and, and meet with them and see how you can get your communities engaged and start innovating, because there's a pretty white set of communities, I would say, within those communities as well. Um, so when you're talking about you know, environmental justice and the environmental movement, it seems like that there's a, a piece that can be addressed there. Right? Does that make sense? Is that happening uh, here? I'm going to understand. Are you talking about innovation when it comes to e equipment that's used to help reduce toxins? Uh, it's a wide variety of innovations that are happening mm -hmm. um, from software solutions to clean tech to wind to solar to um, you name it. And so your, your voices are really important in helping to, you know, to serve the communities that you're talking about. Well, one of the things that we're finding is that a lot of the industries, you know, from coal-fired power plants to refineries and chemical plants, they have a lot of the knowledge concerning what they can do to reduce toxins. But the, the real issue is how much money do we spend on it? Is it worth it? Why not just leave it the way it is? If it's not broke, don't fix it. That's the mentality a lot of them have. I'm talking about like more of a grassroots incubators and accelerators where the next generation oh. of ideators are working on real solutions to address environment. And then the next generation, that, that those are the people that potentially can affect the larger systems as well, if that makes yeah. sense. Mm -hmm. well, Dude, go ahead. Well, I believe that if the government agencies like the EPA, they have the power. I mean, they, they shut down whoever they want. It's just that what I've found is they too discriminate. They go, if there's a TC in a white community, they have the knowledge, they have the power to go in and shut down that company and make them clean it up. Um, because the same company that dumped in my community, there were other areas, there was probably like 20 places around the country and they cleaned up in these places. It's just that EPA discriminates too and they, clean up where they want to. And I think they have the power to, to hold people accountable, to lock them up. That's what will stop a lot of the injustices, is if they would just do their job. We've only got about five minutes left, so I'm just gonna go ahead to the, did you wanna chime in real well, quick? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know anything about these innovators and incubators, so, but, but it's triggering something more general in me, so I hope this will not offend. Um, I don't know if they're reaching out to the communities that they hope to benefit. And what I'll just say briefly, and this also goes back to the question about the mainstream environmental groups, uh, is that too often, and I, I know and love a lot of these people, but too often they sit down in a, I picture a dark basement room somewhere, and they come up with great policies, but they haven't gone to the communities that actually live with uh, and, and have the expertise, particularly when they're organizing. When they're organizing, then it's not just one person who's an expert on their community. It's, it's a shared expertise and multiple perspectives. And they know what's working, they know what's not working, and they have a great idea about what the solutions are. Why not start there? Yeah. Let's get a couple more questions in, in the red here. Yeah, I'm actually glad that you steered the conversation back that way. I think that one of the things that we're not talking enough about is something that Dr. Bullard has talked a lot about over the years, and certainly something Luke Cole has talked about, which is the competing agendas in the environmental community. Yeah, yeah. And so um, I think a good microcosm to kind of examine this was about 10 years ago when all the energy money started flowing to the big environmental NGOs around the country. And they would pick key states where a number of coal plants were slated to be built. And they would do big organizing of all the environmental groups in the community. Well, in some of those communities, there were existing client community-based organizations. Some of them had attorneys and organizers already working. And often those people were left on the table. Um, I was working for a regional nonprofit organization representing folks in Taylor County, Florida. And there was a big, um, meeting around the state about what we should do about the Taylor County coal plant, 
and not present was the Taylor County residents or their attorney at the time. Um, and so when you look at the competing agendas, you have to say, is the goal to help the communities or is the goal to get a reduction in the number of power plants? And where is the synergy and how do we do that from the ground up? And that drives back to Luke and lawyers on tap, not on top. Maybe you want to respond to that or we can just move to another question. Any other questions? Go ahead. Yeah, I have a question. I've been doing environmental justice work for about 20 years. I'm going to take the conversation back to the illnesses and access to health care. So I started EPA work in 1994. In 2006, I found out that I've been exposed to as both asbestos as a child. On my street in western Pennsylvania was an asbestos plant that processed 80% of the asbestos that came out of Libby, Montana. Mm -hmm. We got a letter saying that, you know, we better go to the doctor, get tested, make sure we don't have cancer or mesothelioma. I went to the doctor. The doctor told me not to tell my insurance company that I had been exposed to asbestos because they wouldn't pay. Mm. I had a, a chest x-ray, which I have to have every year, scar tissue, and fortunately, I have health insurance. But there are people on my street, we had like 10 houses on my street, five people with lung illnesses or death. And when I called law firms trying to get somebody to extract money from WR Grace, um, they wouldn't represent anybody until we're sick. So in terms of maintenance care or monitoring, health care isn't available. And I want to know a little bit about uh, whether or not you experience any problems with access to health care. Anyone? How does that resonate, access to health care? Well, I know in our community, when, when you talk about uh, the Deer Park area in Houston, or you talk about a community called Baytown, Texas, which are predominantly low-income people of color, many of them, uh, until the, um, the uh, Healthcare Act that's been designated now, many of them didn't have insurance. They couldn't afford insurance. I mean, <laughs> you have to either buy your medication or you pay this monthly fee for something that may happen in the in the future. Yep. And this is what a lot of folks are wrestling with in low income communities. Do I spend my dollar here or there? And most of the time they choose the latter and choose not to have health care. This is why emergency rooms <laughs> across the country are full most of the time. Uh, poor people trying to get some type of assistance. And I think it, it would be behoove of everyone to always take preventive measures. And this is something I think we should take a closer look at. How can we get more people in low-income communities, which would sort of reduce the burden on our healthcare system, to take preventive steps in taking care of their bodies and taking care of their families? But that has always been a problem, so yeah, I mean, it's a no-brainer in West Port Arthur and throughout, I'll say 80% of Port Arthurans, they do not have health care at this time. And they need it. And they need it. it. Yeah. Uh, I'm being given the signal that we are out of time, so uh, I'm sure you can ask questions of these folks independently, but let's give them a hand.